Hello, bright suns, everyone, and welcome back to the Hollywood Critic Association's Book of Boba Fett After Show. Today, we will be discussing episode two, The Tribes of Tatooine. So if you haven't watched yet, stop now because this will be a spoiler discussion and just come back later. Um, but it was written by John Favreau and directed by Steph Green. But before we get into the nitty gritty of this episode, let's introduce our panel of hosts. I'm Maggie Lovett from Your Money Geek and Collider. And joining us today for the first time is Laura. Laura, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Laura Sirikul. I'm a freelance writer, but I also am editor for The Nerds of Color. So I'm really excited to talk the chat about this episode. Excellent. And John is joining us again. Please introduce yourself. Hey, everyone. My name is John Roca. I'm a writer, producer, and host over on my own outlet, The Outlaw Nation, there on YouTube, and uh, co host of The Jedi Way, which I do every couple of weeks with my fellow Star Wars aficionado, Laura Kelly. So excited to jump into the book of Boba Fett because uh, I'm a massive Boba Fett fan. Yes. And this was such a good episode for Boba Fett fans who really wanted to get into that kind of in-depth character study. And we talked about that a little bit last week, but this week really went hard with it. It was a 52 minute episode and those first 15 minutes focused on the present storyline and then everything else just went right back to his time with the Tuscans. So let's talk about kind of general overview, how we felt about this episode. And I'm gonna throw it to Laura first. Um, you know, I really, I really enjoyed it because I um, I love backstory of, of, of Boba Fett because I wanna know I like because when we got the we got a taste of how he interacted with the Tuscan Raiders, and I was just like, okay, yeah, they respected him. So what? What? what now is he part of the group? But it's nice to see this journey of where he went, what he went through to gain their respect and to kind of like the mutual respect for each other, like and the fact that he's part of their member. Because yes, yeah, saving the kid that that the Tuscan Raider kid was one thing, but we really got to see growth of Boba Fett and also growth of the Tuscan, the Tuscan Raiders for me, like mm -hmm. um, from more than more so than the brut brutality in the first episode. So I, I, I really love the, that we really got to see growth, not only for Boba Fett, but for the Tuscan Raiders. Um, and then kind of see how that's going to be related to the current times. So mm -hmm. I kind of, I kind of love that how we get to know, the Boba Fett that is the current, the current that that we that we see currently, um, and then I also love seeing the huts uh, and and seeing yes. um, some history, like the, some of the canon stuff pop up um, the, with the Rancor, like even though it's not there, but it was like the mention of it, like of Jabba's uh, pit, you know. And I I really I it, it felt like I was watching like. Um, it just felt like I was, oh, well, I mean, I've always feel like I'm watching the Star Wars, but I felt like I'm I'm going back in time, watching all the Easter eggs and stuff. So it was nice to have that. And also always great to see Finnick um, and also, also great to see Jennifer Beals. But yeah, I overall, I really enjoyed this growth of how Boba Fett came to be the Boba Fett we know now. Mm -hmm. I agree. Now let's start over with John. John? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I mean, this episode was what? Uh, Mission Impossible, Lawrence of Arabia, <laughs> um, Young Guns even, The Natural. Yes. There was so many illusions that were so organically uh, weaved into this backstory for Boba. You know, people were so upset after episode one. Oh, what, what, this isn't the Boba that I remember. This is the, Well, this is going to be a fully fleshed out Boba. And you've got to be patient. Mm -hmm. Remember the days when we didn't judge something off the first episode and we like watched <laughs> a few episodes and got to enjoy the story. This is a, this is, this was the 52 minutes, which was like, I think 14 minutes longer than the first episode or, or 60 minutes longer than the first episode. And it, we got so much in here. I mean, we got Easter eggs with the black cross chrysanthemum showing up. I mean, in live action, we got Cammy and fixer. We're from the deleted scene. We got the Tashi station. We got this, uh, the allusions to native American, which native Americans in their history and the, the, the history we have with them here in this country, we got that even re very forcefully shown to us here. Uh, and it was alluded to in the last episode. It's very obvious in this episode. So That's a stagecoach and all of that. So, and got to see more with the Tuscan Raiders, get to see more of this culture, get to see more of the tribes. We got a freaky young gun sequence with a lizard going up his nose and putting him <laughs> on, a, on a vision quest. I mean, there's so much here that was so um, enjoyable. And I think the people who said, if you had released both these episodes, 
at the same time to start off Boba Fett, they might have a little more credence after this episode because I think this episode was incredible, phenomenal. We got the Huts coming in, the twins. What, what's their part going to be in all of this? And all of it very, very well directed by Steph Green. And I tweeted this out before we started the show. If she's not on your short list for directors for any theatrical feature you got going on, your list isn't finished. So, I mean, this is just incredible stuff. Watchmen, now here. Just great to see the work she did in this episode. She's such an incredibly talented director because mm. I, you know, I was really marveling at how there's so many little things about this episode that are silent. Like it's still a very quiet episode. So while right. it's you know written by John, there's a lot of room for playing around as a director and creating those really dynamic scenes and setting up yeah. these like awe-inspiring shots with the you know the train heist right. and all of these different little details. But I really love that we got to see more of the Tuscan culture. We talked about this a little bit last week during the after show that I was really hoping that they would develop the Tuscans and we got to see some of their funerary customs and seeing how that affected yeah. Boba. We got to see their like initiation practices. Um, you know, one of my friends was saying on Twitter that that felt like watching a powwow and like having these like very mm. visceral cultural um, kind of identifiers for, mm. for Star Wars fans who've never seen themselves represented in certain ways in Star Wars. It was really nice to see that really being like done well. Uh, and finally kind of redeeming the Tuscans. They never really needed to be redeemed, but like redeeming them in the eyes of the fans who like only know about them really from Anakin murdering them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it was like, it's all these like little moments that are making the show so special. Um, but let's flip back a few pages in this chapter <laughs> and go back to that interrogation scene at the beginning. Uh, you mentioned the Ranker. Uh, I, I believe it was Laura, uh, Laura that yeah. mentioned the Ranker. Getting to see that again, were you excited to see like that part of Java's Palace? Um, John, you want to go? Because I oh, yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, that was fun to see the gate coming up again, to see Fennec leading that person in, seeing the back and forth, and then I mean, hearing of a new assassin crew and then dropping down. And it's a great joke, it's played for great jokes and then leading to the mayor stuff. So it was nice to see us touching base with that palace and then using that as a foundation to go to the next thing. So yeah, great Return of the Jedi callbacks that I love that they're just sprinkling in. They don't have to make it overt. They're just sprinkling it in and we're moving on with the rest of the story. So that was fun to see for sure. It was so interesting to see how they laid out those first 14 minutes because it's kind of like a wild goose chase. You know, they yeah. get this information from the assassin. They take him to the mayor, voiced by Robert Rodriguez. And that whole scene plays out and then it takes them straight back to the sanctuary. And I want to know both of your opinions. Do you think that Thwip knows more than she is letting on to? Because she seemed like, like you said, sweating like something mm -hmm. on Mustafar. Um, I, I think there's more to her story. And I'm curious to see what both of you think. So I'll, I'll oh, go yeah. to Laura first. And no, of course. Um, I mean, you don't waste Jennifer Beals. If you get her, you yeah. don't waste her. Like, um, yeah, I, I feel like there's definitely more to her. Um, and I'm getting kind of like the vibes of um, just her kind of knowing the, all the secrets. Like she's like the main person because she is in charge of the place where like the bar, but also like the place like pleasures and everything. So they tend to know all the sec the secrets. So I, I feel like she 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 knows like the the undertaking, the underbellies of of Tatooine and everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. So I think she's gonna be a vital asset. Um or she's gonna turn on him because you know she whoever is the power whoever can I think she's in it for herself, like take care of herself. Mm -hmm. So I feel like whoever could take care of her that it will be the leader will be her she'll be on that side and i feel like it'll be towards the huts in a way because i feel like they they have a lot more power than what we what we think what we see but yeah, yeah you don't waste her <laughs> yeah exactly yeah I, and i love the fact that we have so many moving pieces in this right i mean you've mm -hmm. got the huts who come in out of nowhere the twins there who are java's cousins coming and take over don't even mention them in the first episode now having them come in <laughs> then the mayor you know did, was the assassin right or wrong i don't know they kill him before the assassin can contradict the mayor saying the mayor did not send him you know all of that so that adds more political intrigue and then boom we jump into the fact that garces whip is there what's her role in all of us and she's only in it for just a couple of scenes there mm -hmm. so uh, just kind of letting you know she's there because i think eventually she's going to become a very big part of this story and you're not going to know which side she's on and please don't lose sight of the fact 
that again, this is a female owner in this kind of male, obviously male dominated society. And so she is going to do what needs to be done in order to survive. So I think in the end, she will end up on Boba's side by the end uh, because mm -hmm. she'll see that this is a guy who wants to run this stuff a little bit more fairly. But for right now, she's keeping her cards close to the vest because she does not want to, you know, fall on one side or the other. And her being nervous about the huts is that a is that a game? Is, is she playing at that, or is she really nervous about them? I don't know. But I like that we don't know what's happening with her. It makes it more of an exciting character to watch mm -hmm. as it uh, develops uh, uh, over the next few episodes. I agree. I was I was like, did she send the assassin? Is she setting this all right. up? Like, yeah. There feels like there's so many little, like you said, pieces moving, and it feels like a crime drama. Like yeah. we're learning these like different like crime bosses and the different groupings uh, in Mos Espa. Uh, and I, I lost my mind when the Hut twins showed up. Like mm -hmm. I, for some reason, I never even like pictured seeing the Huts in a live action television series. I just was like, no, they're not going to do it. It's like, you know, it's been done. We've seen them in the movies. We're not going to see the Huts. And then here comes their litter and, <laughs> you know, all of their grandeur and like the the one hut's holding that like little rat creature and like stroking it on his face and oh like, yeah <laughs> completely distracted me from what he was saying i had to like rewind and like re-see what he was saying so i was like <laughs> oh that's that's so gross <laughs> just so gross um but the moment where uh black kristen walks out mm -hmm. from behind for comic book fans i don't know yeah. if either of you are like super caught up oh. in comic books but like what was your reaction? Uh, I was 10 years old. I was 10 years old yelling. That's what I felt like. I felt like, you know, just, the great thing that a lot of the, the shows have done, uh, you know, the Mandalorian and this show, and I'm sure uh, Kenobi will and and or down mm -hmm. the road, they great they have a they do a great job of going back uh, and making certain things and pl plucking certain things and making them canon, right? Live mm -hmm. action. Seeing Ahsoka Tano last season on Mandalore was incredible seeing uh black Crescenton come in i was just like oh my god this is real like this is going to be live action this is going to be awesome and the way he was kind of walking around and then boba making taking that little shot at him about uh, killing <laughs> was a trandoshan guard who's asleep or something like that or from yes. behind you know all of that so that was so for the for the fans that are hardcore star wars fans that's an mm -hmm. awesome easter egg for fans who are not uh you know hardcore star wars fans that's a character that immediately grabs your attention. Just the way that they built the uh, outfit, the costume, the armor. looks so intimidating. Looks yes, so and good. the armor as looks well. So good. Yeah. yeah, I love it. But then it also, I love that it introduces fans for to mm -hmm. that world, to the comic book mm -hmm. world, and to that stuff. Because I've, when I did my research and stuff, like yes, I recognize the character. I don't know the character fully, but mm -hmm. then it made me intrigued with getting to know the character more. So I feel like this is great as a great introduction for people who aren't fully like, like, wait, who is this? Like, cause I only know the television and, and, and movies, but it, but it, it really gets you like, oh, there's more than just like, like mm -hmm. they really get you to research it. And so I really enjoyed reading the backstory more about this character. And I'm looking forward to it, just reading their backstory and then how they're going to deal with Boba Fett. That's like the cool part. Yeah, yes. and, we, and we may not be done with him, uh, Laura and uh, Maggie, because like he's tussled with Kenobi in the past. So is he going to show has. up mm -hmm. in Kenobi down the road? I don't know. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting how, you know, a lot of franchises bring characters in and incorporate things. And sometimes it's very heavy handed, like, yeah. oh, we're going to dedicate an entire episode to this flashback about this character because, you know, fans don't know about this character or, you know, general audience don't know about this character. And I love how both the Mandalorian and now the Book of Boba Fett are really naturally incorporating characters and it doesn't like distract from the main story. Yeah. And one of those in this episode in particular was the introduction of, or reintroduction of the Tashi station and Cami and Fixer, which I got like weirdly emotional over. <laughs> um, like I, I teared up and I was like, maybe this is too early. Um, but it was so nice because if you're not um, a hardcore fan who knows about deleted scenes and characters that ended up, you know, making it on the cutting room floor, you, it doesn't take away from the, the episode at all for you. You're like, oh, okay, they're just two residents of the area that are getting, you know, roughed up by these goons. Um, but for fans or somebody watching with the subtitles on, you're like, that's Cammy because mm -hmm. they don't, they never say their names. It's just the, the subtitles. And then if you know who they are, and it was such a nice way to be like, 
This is the Tatooine that you have grown up with. This is the Tatooine that you are familiar with. These are friends of Luke Skywalker's. Right. Like, and seeing them in, in a new light was so fun. And I'm loving what the show is doing with incorporating little details that don't overshadow what's happening with Boba Fett's story. Mm -hmm. um, and did you? Oh, I thought you were saying something. <laughs> um, but <laughs> no, it's great. Heard... To see, it's great to see Cammy and Fixer in there because, like, like you said, the cutting room floor and all of that. But this is the book of Boba Fett. So exactly. you're not going to get like, hey, what's your name? Is your name Cammy? I remember you from there's not going to be any of that. So what he saw is what we are going to get. And so he's yeah. not he didn't. There were just a couple of humans there and he took care of business because he's got to get these bikes and, and whatever. So he's not going to sit there and have a nice conversation with them. By the way, I love the button on the scene with the bartender just calmly cleaning up the broken glass. Like it's, <laughs> it a, so it's another Wednesday <laughs> night at the bar. You know, it's like it's no big deal. I love that. But yes, having them being a part lets me know that maybe we are going to get more with them down the road as well. And I think for the yeah. people who wrote the original character, George Lucas, I mean, this feels like these guys are all, so true. you know, like giving love to George for what he originally created and bringing in these characters is, a, I think, a way of like saying thank you. And and I, I wonder what they're going to do with them because they've become legend amongst the Star Wars fans. Oh, yes. And I love how much of a Western it felt like in that oh, moment. Yeah. It, you know, he was going yeah. to take out some outlaws to steal their horses, and then he comes back with the whole herd. Yeah. Uh, and I just yeah. love the reactions of the Tuscans to be like, oh, parts, we can like salvage this. And he's like, no, no, we need this for the train heist, which was such a fun uh, kind of situation for them to, to be put into. And I was wondering if both of you had any kind of thoughts that this was very similar to Solo. And the whole heist. <laughs> yeah, what would you think, Laura? Do you think that? Did you feel it was? It was uh, I really, I really in uh, like the um, like I, uh, I'm trying to remember solo. Like, yeah, I, I, it, well, when I was watching it, I did think of, I did, no, I did think of like, well, well cause my, cause my, cause. Oh, uh, Laura, <laughs> she's like, I was trying to remember solo. Did, did, did it come out? I don't. Did, know. It did, 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 did it? I'm trying did to remember I enjoy it. That <laughs> Did I like? Oh, this, yeah. No, like I mean, I remember the, the train sequence and stuff because, but then I didn't really like that train sequence because my my girl died. But yes. like, right. Yeah. Right. but um, yeah. yes. But I um, so I I I I I didn't connect it to Solo because I just didn't have good memories of that train. Um, <laughs> so, but I I I. I overall, by itself, I felt like it was like a western, and I it reminded me mm -hmm. of. It actually reminded me of like some of the episodes of like of like visions where like it, mm. like it, they had oh, the yeah. it was very western and right. I felt like it was just on the screen for me like instead of live action um, and like the Ronin episode like I really mm. felt like it was just very western and very um, uh, but also actually the action is just amazing but I didn't I, I I'm sorry I didn't get any solo feeling <laughs> uh, because I just I think I blocked that in my head that, that they just seen. I love solo of as a character I love like the, what they did you're like I have um, nothing against Han Solo just I have the nothing against movie. Han Solo I have no, that, and yeah. the movie overall was fine um but just that scene I I kind of have like I'm sour about that scene but um but I I, I but I did I, I do I do um yeah, the 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 whole train sequence was like pretty pretty amazing, and it it felt with the whole western like they're riding, they hit run into it and everything. I I I honestly felt like like she the Steph did, like did an amazing job with capturing your attention of like I don't know. I just I, overall I just thought it was one of the best sequences I've seen of all the Star Wars like even. Mm -hmm. It felt like Mandalorian level, but mm -hmm. maybe a little bit more actiony. Like I, I felt like it was just—it's hard to explain because I was just now I'm thinking about Solo. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I get what you're saying because that sequence yeah. was shot so well and so well. the it, it's very dynamic because there's so many little pieces that are happening at the same time. You've got the Tuscans trying to get on the top. You've got Boba. You've got people falling off. You've got the droid inside. And it, it did feel so Western. It felt like taking over the train car. I don't know if anyone plays Red Dead Redemption, but it reminded me kind of like that kind of vibe, like all of us going to like our posse, taking down, you know, something. It had such a great vibe. And I was looking, John, did you get the same kind of solo vibes? Yeah. Or Oh, yeah. I absolutely thought of solo for sure. Right. I mean, the, all the stuff on top of the train sequence, all of that, mm -hmm. very, very reminiscent of solo for sure but you know i'm called the outlaw because i'm a massive fan of westerns that's my brand so to me 
the Western um, elements of this were so obvious to see. You got the kind of allusions to, to jo uh, John Ford's stagecoach, the John Wayne mm -hmm. film there from way back when. But also there have been numerous sequences in, in Westerns where you see that it's the Native Americans that are treated as the villains and it's the mm -hmm. cowboys. It's the people inside the stagecoaches that are you know harboring stuff that's really important to them and blah, blah, blah. Well, now seeing it from the other side, I thought was genius. Absolutely brilliant mm -hmm. to see and hear finally uh, what they're talking about, which is these off-world people coming on. And, and Maggie, you mentioned this last week when we were doing the show, mm -hmm. the fact that the Tuscans are the indigenous people of Tatooine, this episode left no doubt that that's their approach to portraying the Tuscans uh, uh, and what they're going and why they're things that they're doing and seeing them get killed and, you know, throwing the bodies on the pyre. You're seeing the ramifications, the consequences in the movies. We see them just right off and they're the heroes. But now in the, here's the other side where these people are threatened by this kind of technology because it's going through their land without their permission and paying no toll. So we and we're seeing them die. So we're seeing all the costs of what that life is like. So to me, I thought it was really well done and uh, brilliantly choreographed. Had that Mission Impossible feel as well for the first one with that train sequence with Tom Cruise and all of them. But also seeing how he worked with the Tuscans together to get this whole sequence. And then at the end, him sitting almost kind of... Sh um, how can I say it's foreshadowing him sitting on a throne later on, as we see in present day, he was essentially sitting on a makeshift throne there outside the train, asking them questions, which was also very reminiscent of Lawrence of Arabia. When they take over the trains, the Bedouin mm -hmm. tribes, the indigenous tribes knocking down these trains because they're going through their lands without their permission. Yeah, yes, and I that get Lawrence of Arabia. I'm sorry. No, I know I don't get that vibe. Like I was watching, I was just like, oh, it kind of, I'm, I'm wondering if he got, it, he was inspired by, by by like by those films and, and like what yeah. who who really inspired this and like I got a feeling of Lawrence of Arabia when I was watching one of the scenes I'm like oh mm -hmm. this is cool like I would I would hope that uh, John like really got inspiration from that because it really mm -hmm. reminded me of that. Mm -hmm. I would love for Star Wars to put out a book that's like this is every movie I watched when writing this <laughs> script just because it's so interesting to see like those little influences because yeah. we can naturally see it but there, you know there's always those kind of hidden ones that are less obvious. Um, but, you know, going back to the that scene of him on the makeshift throne, yeah. I loved everything about that scene from him and his disdain when he's talking about the spice from the, the slave mines of Castle, which is so great. Mm -hmm. so obviously, there's been a lot of conversation and fandom recently with the rebranding of the fire spray and dropping the slave one name. And yeah. I think it'll be really interesting if that is maybe developed a little bit and if he has some disdain for slave trade, uh, which is obviously something that is happening in the Star Wars universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just love that whole moment. But I also love when he advocated for the Tuscans and that mm -hmm. this is their land. And we also get a bit of history about Tatooine. I thought it was really interesting about the sea and the ocean mm -hmm. and you know, last week we talked a little bit about the, the waters and Camino, and then we see that come back a little bit later in this dream sequence that Boba has. Uh, and I just really want to know if you all squirmed when that lizard jumped on his face and <laughs> jumped into his nose, because I, I was like, nope, <laughs> nope, things stay out of my nose. But, you know, that whole, that whole scene was so funny because Tamora Morrison's reaction... <laughs> Treaded this really funny line of like trying not to be like react poorly to their customs, but also being like, I think I swallowed them. <laughs> oh, my. I laughed so I snorted actually when I watched it and then woke up everyone in my family because I was just like, oh, he goes, Sorry, mate, I, I, I think I swallowed it. And then I was just like, I was just like, oh my god, that's the funniest line. I have uh, like because it was all serious, like, oh, it's gonna be a, a, a like, oh, it's gonna be a whole like drug-induced scene it's gonna be amazing and then he goes oh i swallowed it i think i swallowed it sorry and i just like I, I i laughed i was like oh my god like that's like the best scene um and that, it was just beautifully done too because like the whole drug-induced uh sequence of that and knowing their customs and um and seeing him go through this journey it was and it was beautifully shot too so i i i, I really love seeing that aspect of like how like the tuscan raiders are just more about their customs and the traditions and mm -hmm. how um Boba Fett really instead of them accommodating him he really wanted to accommodate them and did the sign mm -hmm. language and tried to learn everything and and bring it bringing things to them um and trying to be at their 
follow them, not try to like convert them. And so mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. And like a lot of it, and like, I think uh, someone posted on, on, on Twitter, like that it was a lot of Maui connections. Oh, I could see uh, that. Yeah. Course. There's a lot of Maori yeah. connections of not only because Native Americans also are land, the lands were stolen. We, right. we like Americans stole it. Like, um, well, not your, everyone, the white people, uh, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> stole it. No, you're right. Um, um, but it's also the same in the Maori cult culture. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. that, that, um, he, I think that's what, uh, you know, he, like, um, he, like Tamara really connected, like felt like connected that culture into this. And mm -hmm. so I felt, mm -hmm. I really felt connected to like, this is a really deep story. And I really, I, as a, as you know, as a person of color, this is, it was just, it, it opened my eyes even more about this, like the, this journey that Boba Fett goes through and just the character and the actor himself too. Mm -hmm. But yes, one the the scene, the lizard scene. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got so deep with it, but you know, last week we talked about these themes that we're really starting to to build into. And when I was watching the episode, I was I think it was you, John, that said this yeah. about the rebirth of Boba yeah. Fett. Yeah. Uh, did this feel like a more genuine rebirth? Like now he's officially been born. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think so. I mean, this was all leading to that moment where they. Which remember we've gotten the first episode where they dressed him in the armor. This is mm -hmm. in essence him being dressed in the armor and the robes of the Tuscans. By the end of the episode, this is his journey, his progression, his rebirth. You know, and people are complaining, "Oh, well, why does he care about animals? Why is it? Where's my bloodthirsty Boba drinking blood?" And it's like, no, this is a different guy. We've got to understand who this person is, and certainly the stuff that he's experienced, and we saw it in the vision that. We saw more of him seeing his father, Django, going away in the in the in the Osprey, the Slave One ship. You go in there, we see more of that. We saw more of Camino, and the fact that it ends with these waves crashing that tells you how important like water is to this situation. And water is also a symbol of rebirth, baptism, whatever. It's you know water birth. It's all there, so it's there to show you that he is. This is a way of rebirthing the character into the canon Star Wars universe. So I think it did a really great job throughout. And yes, Mary, maybe borrowing a little bit of Wrath of Khan to have a little thing climbing into his nose or climbing into his ear, I thought was nice. And, and it's like showing you, hey, we're all friends here. We're all playing in the same sandbox. It's totally cool. Literally. Yeah, literally, yeah. And having all the, the visions and everything and him going to the tree. I mean, that's, that's some awesome dream stuff that they oh did. God. And I think it's gutsy. Because there are probably a lot of Star Wars fans who are like, oh, why are we getting visions? Why are we getting this? And it's like, no, we're taking you on a on a journey here. And either you're coming with us or you're not, but we're not backing down from what we're doing. And so I really appreciated the gutsiness of putting that in this uh, in this story. Oh, I agree completely. This was the first time that I was like, wow, Star Wars is finally giving me the stories that I have been desperate for. Yeah. This is the kind of like pushing the limits just a little bit, going a little bit further and creating, I don't want to say creating cinema, but creating things that feel like art house film, the crashing mm -hmm. waves felt like some sort of dream sequence from like an art house, a 24 film. Yeah. Having all like this David really Lynch cultural, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All <laughs> this like overlaying dream sequence and seeing, you know, the tree wrapping around him as he's inside of the Sarlacc and all of these different like elements. Mm -hmm. it, I, I was like, this is no star Wars I've ever seen before, but I want more of this, whatever this is, give me more of it because star Wars has always been its best one. It's a little bit weird. Uh, and with the from the lizard to the dream sequence to him being like, oh, I thought that was part of the dream. <laughs> the <lizard laughs> popped back out. Like it was just, it was so unique and interesting. And I hope that we continue to carry that kind of um, new rebirth of Star Wars vibes through this, as well as you know the next couple of uh, Star Wars TV series we get, because yeah. uh, it, it just it makes it richer and more engaging and. I know this is it. It felt like a dream sequence for me. I was like, am I, am I really awake right now watching this? Cause this is every, I, I cried. I was like, this is everything I've wanted from the star Wars. Uh, so it was just so, so great. Uh, but I wanted to know kind of like, did everything work for you? Um, was there anything that you hoped that they had shown more for, or that you're, you know, weren't super happy with, um, we'll go, we'll go to Laura first. Um, no, I, I, well, I wish I had, uh, like I'm, I'm, I understand why they ended the sequence the way they did with the, with the, with every the cultural like, it's a cultural dance that the Tuscan mm -hmm. readers do, and I appreciated that. Mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, but I was hoping they would go back 
to the current times and how it all it ties in because now we only have four episodes left mm -hmm. so it kind of like for me when it ended it kind of ended for me i'm like but how does it tie to the beginning like he like i i, I always love things to make sense like where it's like beginning he and then he thinks about his past and then it, it reflects to his decisions like just even if it's like a scene like his decisions mm -hmm. then um, so I kind of, I kind of, I felt incomplete, but it could be because they want anticipation for four episodes. So I guess like, I, I'm, I accept that because I'm like, I, I trust the, I trust, I trust the writing. I trust the, the directing. So I, I'm, I'm fine with it, but I kind of felt like incomplete because even though at the end, like I was like, that's a great way to end the sequence, but I just felt incomplete because I like things connecting. Like, it, because when I, when I watched the, the, the sequence of, of um, with the Tuscan Raiders, like, I know people are gonna say, oh, it's a filler. I'm like, no, you're getting to know his journey. You're getting to know him as in the Boba Fett now and how his decisions are gonna affect, hmm. like, but, but, uh, like his, how the, his journey is gonna affect his future decisions. Right. And, and so, but I just like, I like feeling complete. Like, I like feeling like, okay, that's how it's gonna affect his decisions. But I, overall, I really enjoyed this episode, like, because even though I felt like, oh, Go back to it reflect back so it for it so I, it makes sense to me like connections but um i'm fine with it but overall i just i really enjoyed this journey and i really love the cultural impact because you said earlier like oh i love i love the weird and all that stuff and i i love anything that has that provides culture and symbolism to character development and characters of canon um this is the longest episode, so I, I understand they can't go longer than that. But yeah, I, I, I just I love this episode. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I was wondering if we'd get that kind of book ending, the, the connection of kind of hammering home what this kind of relates to in the present. And I feel like maybe it's it's family because there was that little comment from the mayor. Who, I think it was the mayor. Uh, it might have been one of them that talked about uh, how to have a family and like the, the family, like a mobster, the family. And I wondered if it was kind of a, a reflection on that kinship that he, he finds with the Tuscan Raiders. Uh, but John, what were your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, if there's anything I would ding it for is I needed more Fennec Shand. I, I know we got yes. her at the beginning, you know what I'm saying? And she had, she had the, you know, maybe the Rancor will make it talk. So she's clearly... Of the two, she's the one that's willing to go that extra mile to get the information. And it's essential. Like Boba balances out Fennec's more bloodthirsty um, instincts. And uh, Fennec uh, provides a much needed counsel to Boba in this situation, a harder counsel to get the answers, you know. And so, but I think they're taking a little bit for granted that we already ship this relationship and enjoy yes. it. <laughs> so they feel like they don't have to spend as much time. But mm -hmm. I want more conversations with Fennec and with Boba about these dreams. Remember, he said in the first episode, Maggie and Laurie said the dreams are back. Well, why are the dreams back? What is that all about? Did Fennec have to deal with him when the dreams were first happening? What was that experience like for her? And maybe we'll get that down the road. But I need more Fennec Shan because she just was in the first few minutes and then poof, we're off into the whole sequence. And that was mm -hmm. a majority of the episode. So I, I just would like a little bit more with her a little bit more of her taking the lead in certain moments, a little bit more of her kind of staking her claim to her power in Mos Espa, and uh, maybe stuff with her and the Gars of Whip a little bit more would be nice on the side while Boba's doing other things. And her staying silent through the whole twins thing, I thought was a little weird because the, weird the, the female um, of the twins, the sister, is speaking advice to the brother, and, and I, it's brilliant that they don't subtitle. I love that. It's letting us kind of do the work. And so uh, the fact that we didn't have that counter with Fennec doing that with Boba when she's been doing that all along, I thought was a weird decision. She was just like leaning against the wall. Yeah. Watching yeah. it all play out. Yeah. Ready to shoot. But I would like to uh, like to have seen her come closer to Boba and start whispering in his ear so that we'd have like this idea that it's the two women who are really kind of having the ideas of how to, how to maneuver out of these political situations here. And so I would have liked to see more of that, but that's the only thing I could really ding it for. But Laura, you make a great point, having it relate back to the, to the present of what we were experiencing at the beginning of the episode would have been nice. I don't disagree with you there. I agree completely. I was, I was so hoping that we'd get that last scene of him, like talking about something with Fennec to bring her back into mm. the, the, the story. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering if next week we're going to get 
when he finds Fennec Shand, because I'm, I'm confident that's going to have to be oh, yeah. kind of revealed at some point now that he's part of the, the Tuscans and has right. the, the, the shroud robe on. We know that that's what he's wearing when he finds her. Uh, so I'm hoping that when that happens, we get to see more of their partnership and how this all came to be and that mm -hmm. we get more of her as a character. I would love for her to be the central focus of that episode and then the flashbacks just serve as like a counterpoint to it. Uh, Cause mm -hmm. I mean, you don't, you don't cast Ming Na Wen and then not use her to the fullest extent. This is yeah. a Disney princess, a Marvel legend. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, you no. use her. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with you. I feel like I really want, even though we've been seeing Boba Fett's and it is the book of Boba Fett, I really want this next, the, I think there, there will be a focus on the whole episode where current times flashback to when he interacts with, with Finnick, but I really want her point of view Yeah. instead. Yeah, yeah I, I would love to have where, because it's, yes, book of Boba Fett, but you know it's them too as like the, the leads and because they're the, mm -hmm. they're the ones who are really going to take over and, and control everything. So I I would love to have her point of view rather than just like Boba Fett finding her. And because I want to know how she commits to him so much. She devotes, even though yes, he right. sees her, but it it there has to be more than that. There has to be a mutual mm -hmm. respect too, like earned respect other than, oh, you saved me. Okay, I'm devoted to you for the rest of my life. There has to be <laughs> more than that. Especially since yes. she is an independent assassin as well, like she is her own. And she and gave that all like, up just to. Yeah, right. she could have been it's like, "Thanks a... for thanks for the patchwork. I see. I'll save your life and bye, and that's yeah. it." Like she could have done that, but like a favor, eye for an eye. But uh, but I want to know what made her her point of view committed to him because yeah. it's not like just him him seeing like she's like I'm committed to you. I need to know her journey. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe we'll get a season two. And it'll be the book of Fennec Shand. Yeah, <laughs> it's already the book of Fennec Shand in my head. <laughs> that's true. Like, that's true. That's what I need. Um, <laughs> but you know, we talked a little bit about our wonderful book year, and we talked about mm. the huts and Cammy. Were there any other Easter eggs that either of you spotted? I like mm. racked my brain trying to think of anything that you know I might have missed. Um, mm. uh, Star Wars Easter eggs. I don't. No, I mean, it, the Tashi Station no. stuff was great. Um, but I think for me, it was more of the references. And I, mm -hmm. I want to share something with you guys real quick and see, because I think I can share the screen. Uh, and this, look, this is the end of, I mean, look at that. That is almost exactly, and that's Anthony Quinn in Lawrence of Arabia, uh -huh. almost exactly. With the bandolier how, and everything. Yeah, how Boba walks out of the tent. And so for me, I thought that was so genius uh, to have that as an element here to show this, the illusions, even though he comes out and kind of shows himself, that's how Anthony Hop Anthony Quinn's character was in, in Lawrence of Arabia. So it's not Lawrence of Arabia, Lawrence that we're profiling. It seems almost like you're profiling a little bit of the Anthony Quinn character from Lawrence of Arabia. So I appreciated that uh, that element to it uh, overall. So yeah, I mean, it was more the movie references that were getting me jazzed. And but I want to ask you guys something uh, to put. And of course, Laura asked uh, the Easter eggs and, and Maggie. But like, what this was? This was this had elements as we've seen in other movies and TV shows of the white savior story, right? A person coming in teaching the uh, teaching the kids in dangerous minds. T Lawrence of Arabia having the white guy come in and steer them. This was interesting to have a person of color do this, a person of color kind of step in to the white savior role and teach the um, the Tuscans how to navigate this technological world. Did you guys like that they kind of turned this on its head and did it bother you at all that they kind of used that trope and, uh, and uh, yeah, as I said, turned it on its head? I love when people of color uh, and, and women of color, women too, mm -hmm. take ownership of a trope that is typically for mm -hmm. white people. Yeah. Um, for me, it's not really a trope. It's some. It's just taking ownership of of um, uh, of a story and the fact that it, this show, the series, is two people of color leads. Right. As and, and, and like um, I and plus I feel like it felt really. Ref refreshing knowing that you know he's maui mm -hmm. and and yes. you know he is the one kind of like leading the charge uh versus a white guy white savior coming in um especially with you know if, if people know the history of the maui people um it it just felt like it if 
it felt really good to see that a person of color just taking the lead and taking taking over these tropes. Um, mm -hmm. And also culturally, I've, I, so like I, 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 I know more about Maori culture because of Taika Waititi because I'm obsessed with him. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> uh, so I just felt like it really, I, I really love that it, that Tamara put his own, like his own culture into this story and himself. Uh, um, and like he mentioned with the Tuscan, he added his own like elements to it. And so I kind of appreciated that he has taken ownership of the series and he has taken ownership of the story of Boba Fett. And he, he, he is in control and, and handling the story of, it, it's just, it's just beautiful to see someone, a person of color who from, a, from a, uh, like a group that is like, that has been like demoralized from like the, in their, their people have been like that. So I kind of felt like it really empowering. And I feel like Maori mm -hmm. kids, can watch this and feel empowered by watching this like story of like him taking ownership and being the hero. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's interesting the way that they have kind of handled that, that trope, so to speak, mm -hmm. is because it doesn't feel mm -hmm. like he's forcing them to change. He's like, I am right. presenting you with tools. You can take these tools. And then once I'm on my way, you can ditch them if you want to. It's, it's much more like we understand each other. And so I'm going to help you out of the situation that you are being pushed into by these off worlders, mm -hmm. giving you the tools to be safe and then kind of going on my way. And I, I, I think that works really well. And, you know, like Laura was saying that so much of Tamora Morrison has been put into this character. And I think that's part of the appeal of the character now mm -hmm. is he's not just a, a cardboard cutout bounty hunter. He's this, this character that you can feel so much depth and humanity and experience. And he, he feels like a little boy who has lost everything and has no idea who he is. And he's finding himself again. And it's nice to see that parallel with finding a culture and finding these yeah. kind of shared experiences. Um, you know, we obviously we don't know, it, you know, exactly how how much he's seen of the Tuscans, but the way that he just fell into step with that the dance at the end, that that tribal yeah. experience was so just it warmed my heart because <laughs> yeah. it, it's it's so nice to to see people seeing themselves in star wars this is something that I, I always talk about like it's so nice to log on to twitter after an episode and see people being like this is this is my people on in star wars mm -hmm. and it's it's just it's so refreshing it's you know bring in the art house bring in that connection bring in all of these new elements into star wars and i think that i think lucasfilm really has something special yeah, yeah, and I also feel like he didn't. He he didn't like the Great Wall. It's like, oh my God, Matt Damon, he saved China. But <laughs> Not like, that movie. <laughs> yeah. So it felt it didn't it didn't Oof. feel like that. It because there was yeah. mutual for with Tamara, there was more mutual. Like I never felt like, oh my God, thank God for Boba Fett. They, the mm -hmm. Tuscan Raiders would not be around, right. like be able to survive. I never felt that. And I felt like they all had that mutual thing where he adapted, accommodated them. And then never at the end, yes, in the end, he showed his case, but he he did their cultures in the end and not them like, not like the the, the last samurai was like, here is all the armor of the Japanese. <laughs> like it's, it's not like every, like everything falls on him. It felt like, hey i'm part of you and i'm still going to respect and follow your culture versus mm -hmm. i am part of you you must respect me now like how they mm -hmm. end it in like in the great wall and how they ended in um, last samurai where i never felt that i felt like it was always been in this episode a mutual respect and mm -hmm. him still following their traditions and it never felt a hero like i never felt like it's because of him yeah yeah i love that moment early on in the flashback where he's training and he's not doing so well. And you can tell there's a little bit of pride getting in the way. Like, he's like, I should be able to do this. And then he just finally is like, okay, show me how to do this. Like, I clearly am not. And I, it's that acceptance. Like, I'm trying to find myself in, in this group and not bringing his kind of like own experience into it. So I don't know. It was just the way it's been handled so well is just refreshing. I love it so much. Yeah. I mean, Laura brings up Last Samurai. Uh, I, 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 I will I will defend. I know, I, I know I'm terrible. I, I love that movie, but I think it's a Tom Cruise thing for me. But th that film felt like there was a little bit of the equality as well in terms of like how they were. And Hiroki Sonata, that's that scene where she where the, the I think it's a female Tuscan is teaching him how to use the gaffy stick. That felt very similar to, to similar to Hiroki Sonata in Last Samurai teaching Tom Cruise how to use the samurai sword and whack him across the nose and all those kinds of things. So there was, it took an element of that, I think. And that felt very similar 
uh, maybe the best element of the movie because clearly he's in he's in the submissive position in that scene and put it in here as a training uh, sequence for Bobo, which I thought was nice and it's nice to see him use it because you can't just pick up a weapon and know how to use it. You just can't. And we've seen that too many times, Anakin. Uh, we've seen that too many times of, of someone in Star Wars picking up something and figuring it out quickly. Uh, and it's like, mm -hmm. no, come on. We got to have some time with it, for God's sake. So I like that. And I, I love the gaffy stick at the end when he's yeah. building his oh, own. Oh, and it's, oh that, yeah. the montage. There's yeah. like, there's three really good montages in this episode, but that one just felt like watching something like almost like I'm watching something I shouldn't be privy to. Like it felt like such a like intimate, like mm -hmm. kind of, it more of the rebirth, like finding like a new weapon and building it. And the, just everything about that scene was shot so beautifully. And that goes back to, you know, Steph's um, directorial choices. They're mm -hmm. so strong in this episode. And I hope that she gets to do more Star Wars. I would love to see her working on some of the other, you know, series, um, maybe Acolyte, something like that. Because she just has oh such God. a good eye for compelling stories, and especially when there's not a lot of dialogue. And I just, I love films that don't talk a lot. Um, and just kind of having that, that those shared experiences and, and reading body language. You know, I think mm. one of the, the biggest crimes is the fact that the, the main Tuscans are at the very end of the credits. They should be right up there in the co-stars because they are carrying oh, so point. much. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's a little disappointing. I know that you have to show your face and talk and all that stuff to, to get in those, those positions, but they, they deserve so much credit because they, I mean, the kid following him around like a shadow after he saved him, and like it's just in the background. It's like little moments. Um, it just, it all works so well. Um, but, you know, are, are there any last thoughts that you have, Laura, about this episode, what you're hoping for next week? Um, just more for Phoenix, Shan. But <laughs> <Yeah>. I also, <laughs> but I also, I also want, I really hope that we see the Tuscan Raiders again in the end, like coming down, coming out of, to help him and it, it feels mm -hmm. very tropey too where it's like oh like i need help and it's like the tusky readers come and like it feels very like okay that's like how every movie of like the people help the history like come and help but i want to see them i really love that the characters i don't know if we ever got a name for the one who was all in black who kicked mm -hmm. everyone's asses but i'm obsessed with that one like i'm in <laughs> love with that one um i want if there's an action figure of that i i'm gonna get get that character that's like my favorite character is um, that the one that xavier is playing because i looked at like yeah. the actors and it is a crime that they are covered in masks yeah <laughs> it is it is <laughs> It um, is in this nest all over again. I'm like, stop putting pe pretty people under helmets that don't come off. I know. I'm like, but you just know that they're, oh, anyway, you know like underneath, there. you know they're there. But I, I um, yeah, for this episode, I, I, I overall enjoyed it. And I really hope that we get to see them again in some mm -hmm. kind of capacity or him, like him suffering or something. And he, he has to go back to like, like, to to get guidance or something that's like very tropey too but i just feel like i want to i want to see them again because i feel like it's such a waste of we get to fall in love with these characters and also stuff i hope because deborah chow directed some mandalorian and now she's doing mm -hmm. obi-wan so i feel like this could be a this is a good stepping stone journey for a lot of the directors to run their mm -hmm. own um but yeah i think she would be amazing to have her her own like spin-off and stuff but like a series uh, but I, yeah, I just hope next next week we see more Nick Chan, and also I want to see them again because you made me fall in love with these characters, and I want to mm -hmm. see how somehow they they connect back to the current times because I I love it when things jump back. I agree. Now, aside from more Fennec Shan, John, <laughs> what are you looking for for next week? Uh, I think more that's with the, the same answer for all of us. Uh, yeah, true. But I think more with Garza Whip as well. And then I think mm -hmm. more with the twins. Listen, they've hooked me in. Uh, Laura, uh, Laura Kelly, when we're doing our review on the Geek Buddies on the Outlaw Nation, she said to me, she's, I feel like they climbed into your brain, John, and came up with a show that you love. And I was like, yes, absolutely. Because I don't care if, no, I don't care if a lightsaber gets turned on. I don't care if we never see a Sith Lord. To me, the political machinations going on in here, this is like yes. watching the best of these kinds of shows that we've had in the past that have these kind of political intrigue, these crime dramas, you know, uh, West Wing, Sopranos, uh, for lack of a better, I know House Cards and Persona non grata in that conversation, but it's that kind of best of. And I love that we're seeing all these pieces moving around and we as an audience are challenged to decide who we want to side on, who we don't want to or side with, 
who we don't want to side with. And I love that the show is making you do that. No, Mandalorian was about what's the adventure this week and the overall goal you're trying to get to. This is about going really ground level, street level, and figuring out, as the mayor said, as you alluded to, uh, Maggie, the mayor saying, hey, running a family is much more difficult than being a bounty hunter. And we're going to see that. And we're going to see how his experiences with the Tuscan Raiders are influencing how he's going to run his family once he gets into a little bit more motion as a person of power there in Moss Espa. So I hope we get more of that, more of those dialogue heavy scenes or non dialogue heavy scenes that we don't see the subtitles for that give us more of a more of the character, more of the for lack of a better term, more of the humanity within each of these characters, no matter what species they are. I want to see more of that. And I'm I'm excited to see that in the next episode. And Laura, I didn't even think about the fact that Tuscan Raiders could be coming back later on to save him in this situation down the road. It probably seemed obvious to you. To me, I didn't even think about it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm sure they're setting that up. I'm sure they're setting that I just, up. I love things It'll when they coming. go back. But I also, Absolutely. I forgot to mention, I want to see the Grand Hut Council. Oh, I want to yes. see, get permission to kill. I want to see, I want to see huts. I want to yeah. see, and I, I want to see some humanity with the huts. But like, you know. Yeah. Well, anyway, she said. On. They had to get permission to kill yeah. any of the huts. So, yeah, we could get that council. That could be awesome. Maybe like that, so what we wild. do in the Shadows Council with all the different vampires showing up. <laughs> that would be uh, awesome. Can that episode be directed by Tyga? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or written Matt by Tyga? Ber Matt Berry's in it already. So. I know. Why not? Why not? <laughs> oh, man. I, you know, I would, what I want from the next couple of episodes is I would love to see somebody else writing them. I love John. I think he's a fantastic writer, but I would love to see some different. Uh, approaches to it and see if we get some maybe juicier dialogue because uh, John's mm. I, I, I like John's writing I'm not knocking John's writing but he's very <laughs> surface level sometimes with scenes he yeah. and I would love to see you know more of those those conversations and the, the politicking because I I'm also a huge fan of anything that gives me uh the criminal underbelly of a yeah. world you know I'm a huge fan of the Canto bite scene because you see so much of this like different side of Star Wars and so I want more of that I want more of the sanctuary and what's going on in the sanctuary with Quiff and the the huts and I I'm just so excited to see where this goes because there's a couple different you know, if it's a choose your own story, uh, kind of keep with the book theme, uh, there's a couple different paths that it can go in the next couple of episodes. And so I'm, I'm really keen to see, um, you know, what happens. And, you know, again, going back to Fennec Shand, if we get those flashbacks to him saving her, is it the Tuscans that helped, you know, did they help take her somewhere to, you know, give her those cybernetics? Mm -hmm. You know, there's room for needing another character that further strengthens, you know, what's going on in Tatooine. Uh, so there's just a lot of potential there. And I, I hope that nothing bad happens to any of the characters to get these flashbacks. So I'm just I'm very excited to see where it goes. I, I love seeing Star Wars kind of push the limits and go new directions. And I hope they kind of keep that going um, from here on out. But this was so great. This was such a, a great uh, discussion. And we actually have now talked for as long as the episode was on. So. <laughs> Plan that very well, a minute per minute. Um, but where can everyone find you? Uh, we'll start with uh, Laura. You can find me on Twitter, uh, L Syracool. I put it here, um, L Syracool, uh, L S I R K U L. Um, and I'm always writing, so I always retweet where I write because I write for different places. But you can find me on Twitter. Um, I'm going to be talking about my Tuscan Raiders because I love them so much, especially the one, the, the one in black. I'm obsessed with the, that character. I need I need to see more of that character. Excellent, excellent. John, where and, uh, can they find the Outlaw Nation? Uh, you can always find me. And shout out to Laura catching up on her emails. I love following Laura's travails after the BTS <laughs> stuff and how her catching up with everything. Oh, I know. It's been it's the amazing. best. It's been the best. Um, I'm yeah, sorry. Definitely. No, no, they're the <laughs> best. No, it's amazing. Follow her. Follow her. <laughs> um, we're doing that. The John, uh, the, there's a John and Wendy show. Wendy Lee and I do a show mm -hmm. on my channel, and we always have a K-pop corner. So I always go to Laura. <laughs> To see what the updates are, so I can make sure I'm on the right I track. Definitely follow Laura for that. But you can follow me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. And the Outlaw Nation is there. YouTube.com/slash John Roca says. That's where you find the Outlaw Nation. We do we do film, television, uh, sports, um, pro wrestling, and this week we'll be touching upon the January 6th anniversary on an Outlaw Nation wow. show on Thursday night. So we no topic is untouchable for us that's why we're called the outlaw nation because we don't adhere to anything we do what we want to do so come and follow me there 
I dig it. And you can find me at Twitter at Maggie of the Town. I have a link tree in my bio to make it super easy to find all my various pursuits. I'm talking about Star Wars, Taylor Swift, all sorts of things. I'm <laughs> everywhere. Uh, and I have a review up over at Collider for today's episode of the Book of Boba Fett, which might be a little bit better than where my mind was during this live stream. But until next week, thank you all so much for watching. You can find the Hollywood Critics Association all over social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, be sure to uh, give us a follow over there. Until next week. Bye, everyone.